Welcome back everybody, I'm Robert Breaker and I'm here today in front of the whiteboard to bring you a message entitled True Christianity. True Christianity. I want to talk about this today because there's a lot of false Christianity out there. And I thought it would do good for us to be able to see the difference between true Christianity and false Christianity. So we're going to do that today. Turn, if you will, with me to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. We'll read that momentarily. But before we do, I uh, did a lot of study on my family history. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to bring this sermon to you. Something I found way back when in my family history led to me reading a book that was about Christianity under the title True Christianity. And this is that book. Let me explain that as quickly as I can. I've studied my family history. We go back eight generations to the, the first breaker coming across the pond from Switzerland to America. And uh, that was my fifth great grandfather, George Breaker. George Breaker had a brother named Ulrich Breaker, or Uli. And Ulrich Breaker, he wrote, a journal. He kept a journal of his life, and he's pretty famous over there. And if you speak German, you've probably heard of Uli Breaker or Ulrich Breaker, and they still do plays with his wife Salome. And you can read his book, Der Arme Mann im Toggenburg, The Poor Man of Toggenburg. And it was his life story of Uli Breaker. And Uli would talk about in the house he and his father and his grandfather and I guess the uncles and things like that, they would sit around and they'd talk about the Bible. And they used to read the Bible. And I guess they were Protestants in Switzerland. And it's funny, they used to always read uh, books about the book of Revelation and always talk about, wow, could the rapture be this year? <laughs> kind of like my childhood. I grew up hearing the same thing in my life. And here they were 300 years ago, same thing. But uh, one of the books that they had to read, I think he said it was his grandmother, told him, you got to read this book, was the book by Johann Arndt called True Christianity. And he was a Protestant back in the 1500s. He lived 1555 to 1621. He uh, was a German Lutheran theologian. And he put on paper what he thought true Christianity was. And so I read this book because they would have read it back then. And I went through it, and there's a lot of good in this book. But yet, there's a lot of problems as well, because they don't rightly divide. The best way for me to explain this is Calvinistic Lordship Salvation. That's what this is. And that's what he taught in this book. Yet he got so much right, but then he turned around at the end of the book and undid what he did because he didn't rightly divide. So what I want to do today is I want to talk about this and the importance of having true Christianity and the importance of rightly dividing. Because old Johann aren't, well, he aren't right on some things. And uh, I'm not going to go into everything that he taught, but he did get some things right. But then he turned around and undid it by not knowing how to rightly divide the word of truth. And I just found that very sad, very sad. So 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. 2 Timothy 2.15, our King James Bible says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. And their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hyamaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some." So it's so important, Paul is telling us, to have the right doctrine and to rightly divide so that we don't end up in error and leading people astray. So the Bible says to study. Now, why do we study? There's three reasons here I see to study. Number one, study to show yourself approved unto God. So God will approve of you and your ministry. You need to study. So you don't be ashamed. You ought to be ashamed if you're preaching something that's not right. And then so you can rightly divide the word of truth. So what we want to do today, I want to come up here to the best of my ability, and I want to rightly divide the word of truth. I want to go through the Bible and show you the divisions in the Bible and help you to see how to rightly divide. Because there's people out there who claim to be Christians who do not rightly divide. 
they go to the Bible and they approach it as a buffet table. Oh, I'll take some of that over there. Oh, look back here. This looks good. I'll take this to me. Oh, I like that over there. And I'll take a little of this. And oh, some of that. And they, what the Bible calls, they twist the scriptures to their own destruction. They don't rightly divide. So let's do that. Let's rightly divide. Turn over with me to Hebrews chapter 9 and let's look at the most basic division in the entire Bible. Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9 is the most basic division in the entire Bible, and that is at the cross. At the cross, everything changes, and we see a great big change taking place. And the cross is where it happens. What happens? Well, look what it says in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15. Hebrews 9, 15. Hebrews 9.15 says, And for this cause he, that's Jesus Christ, and for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. 16. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of a testator. For the testament is of force after men are dead, otherwise it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. So we have... The Old Testament, and we have the New Testament. And they are not the same. Here's a clue. One is old and one is new. <laughs> and it all starts when Jesus dies on the cross. That's what makes a transition. That's what makes things new. Okay, it's different. Here's the Old Testament. Here's the New Testament. Do you know there's some people out there running around claiming to be Christians that don't even get that most basic doctrine? There's people out there that are trying to say, no, we're still under the Old Testament. We need to get back underneath that. Your Seventh-day Adventist, for example. Uh, no, we're not under the law. We're under grace. The Bible is very plain to teach. So a true Christian understands that, that we're no longer under the Old Testament. We're under the church age today. We're not under what was for Israel back here under the law. And you need to understand that to be a true Christian. Otherwise, you're a false Christian. And you're trying to mix two things that don't go together. And you're trying to, to force things that don't force together. Let's go to Romans chapter 6. Let me show you. The Bible is very clear. We are not under the law. It all changed when Jesus died. And Jesus died on the cross to forgive us our sins. But he also died on the cross to redeem us from the curse of the law. And we'll see that here in a minute. But look at what Romans chapter 6 says. Now, I still get emails from people to this day <laughs> that tell me, Brother Breaker, you don't even know anything. We're still under the law. And I just shake my head. Wow. That must not be a true Christian. For a true Christian would know that this is a different dispensation. We're in a different time. We're not in the Old Testament. We're in the New. Romans chapter 6, and look at verse 14. Romans 6, 14, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. What part of ye are not under the law don't you understand? The Bible says we're not under the law. We're under grace. We're not in this time period. We're in this time period. We're not in this dispensation. We're in this dispensation. We're not in this testament. We're in this testament. We're not under that covenant. We're in a different one. Okay? So you've got to understand that. Let's turn over to Galatians chapter 3. And oh, that Christians would understand that. Now, there could be some saved people who are in a, uh, a church that teaches otherwise, but if you're saved, come out, as it says in Revelation chapter 18. Come out from among them. Get away from a church that tries to get you back under bondage to the law. Read the book of Galatians because that's what the book of Galatians is all about. Paul is telling him, we're not under the bondage of the law. We're under grace. Galatians chapter 3, verse 10 and 11. We read, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident. For the just shall live by faith. Now let's skip down here to uh, verse 23 and verse 26. Look at verse 23. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. So it's all about faith today. Under the law is all about, now you make sure you do these works. 
But you see the difference? It's not the same, and you can't mix them. It was one or the other. Well, Jesus came to abolish the law. That's what the Bible teaches. Uh, he, as the Bible says, and I've got it on my wall here, in Colossians 2.14, He has forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. So he nailed the law and the ordinances and all that to the cross to, to say, now it's not by keeping the law that you can be saved. No, it's only by faith that we're saved. And a lot of people kept the law trying to get saved, but the Bible says it can't save you. See, when they died, if they kept the law, they went down to Abraham's bosom. They didn't go to heaven. Today, we're saved, we go to heaven. So it was different. They were waiting in Abraham's bosom for Jesus to come and to take them out. Because only he is the one who can save. So you've got to get a hold of that. It's so important. Uh, verse 23 says, but before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith, which should afterwards be revealed. To who? Well, we're going to see here in a minute. Revealed to Paul. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. The law is the schoolmaster, so we're no longer under the law. For you're all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. So the law was the schoolmaster that was to point you to Christ. In other words, you try to keep the law, and I, I owe it to John for sending me this from, a, from a Canada. A lot of people come over here and they try to keep the law. And they find out real quick that you can't keep the law. The harder you try to obey the law, the more you see you're a sinner that can't keep the law. So what is the law supposed to do? Teach you what sin is and to show you that you're a sinner. Thanks again, John, for these. They're magnetic. They're really cool. Appreciate that. These are the Ten Commandments here. So when you keep the law, the law shows you what sin is. It shows you you're a sinner that you can't save yourself. So what do you have to do? You find the one that can save you. So it points you to Jesus. So that's why I believe it's important to read your Bible and become a true Christian. A true Christian is not trying to get back under the Old Testament. A true Christian realizes that was for Israel back then, but now the way of salvation is through Jesus Christ and his blood atonement on the cross. And it's what Jesus did that saves us, not what we do. Do you understand that? So it's not of works, lest any man should boast. We're in Galatians chapter 2. Look at verse 16. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. So it's not the works of the law that saves us, it's faith in Jesus Christ. But by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. So it's not keeping the law that saves us. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So true Christianity does not mix faith and works for salvation. It does not mix the law with grace. True Christianity says, no, it's faith alone. So where does that leave the Seventh-day Adventists who do that? you got to wonder. What does that leave things like the Roman Catholic Church, which believes that it's faith plus works? No wonder they have priests in their church, because they're trying to take them from back here. And they're trying to mix these two things together. And you either can save yourself, or you can't. Well, guess what? No man can save himself under the law. So you cannot get saved through the works. What do you need? You need faith in Jesus. Faith in what he did for salvation. So it says that it's for faith. It's by faith. And then it's salvation through faith alone today that saves. That's what the Bible teaches. And a true Christian understands that. The law was for the nation of Israel. And that's what the Bible teaches. So a true Christian understands that we're in this dispensation, under grace, in a time where we're saved by faith. Faith in what? We'll see that here in a moment. But you've got to understand that true Christianity is on this side, not on that side. Now, people say, does that mean I don't read my Old Testament? No, you should, you should read the Old Testament. It's given for our admonition, for our learning. A lot of examples in there of how not to do things. It also tells us what sin is. 
So we should read the Old Testament to know what sin is. But we don't keep the Old Testament law to try to get to heaven. And that's what a true Christian understands. True Christianity also sees the difference between the ministry of Jesus and the ministry of Paul. Paul the Apostle is in the Bible. He's one of the Apostles. Now, Paul is in the Bible for a reason. Now, there are many people out there today that claim to be Christians, and they say, no, 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 we're not under the law anymore, we're over here after the death of Jesus. But they think we're only right here. And they omit from here to here. <laughs> and they want to believe that we're only in Jesus' ministry, and that's it. Well, that is not true. There was a guy named the Apostle Paul. And Paul's ministry is in the Bible for a reason. And Jesus had with him many apostles. But there was one chosen out of due time named Paul that Jesus Christ chose for a purpose. And there's some people out there today who claim to be Christians who say, and we don't follow Paul, we choose to reject Paul, we want nothing to do with Paul. Well, that's a problem. Because here's Jesus' ministry, and here's Paul's ministry. Which one is for us? Well, many would say both. Hold on there. Let's go to the book of Matthew. When Jesus showed up, he showed up to complete a prophecy. And he was anxious to do it, but the Jews rejected him, so that extended that prophecy way farther out. That, of course, would be the prophecy of Daniel of the 490 uh, years written in the book of Daniel. And the last seven years of that have not been fulfilled yet, so that takes place after the rapture. Here we have the rapture of the church. Here is the seven-year tribulation. And then comes Jesus Christ back at the Battle of Armageddon, and then Jesus sets up his millennial kingdom, according to the Bible. So here's the rapture. Here's the seven-year tribulation. Now, this could have been back here, and then the millennium could have been set up back here had the Jews accepted their Messiah, because that's what Jesus is. Jesus is the Messiah. But because the Jews rejected their Messiah, God said, okay, Paul, you're going to go now more to the Gentiles. Now, does God only save Gentiles today? No, no, God saves Jews and Gentiles. But God is going more to Gentiles than Jews because the nation of Israel rejected their Messiah. So God sent Paul out to them. Now, when Jesus came, look at what the Bible says. When Jesus showed up in his ministry, he did not appear to Gentiles. He did not come to Gentiles. Jesus' ministry was not to come to save Gentiles. Jesus says he came only to Israel to fulfill that prophecy and see whether they'd accept him or not. Look at the very words of Jesus Christ himself. Matthew chapter 15 and verse 24. But he answered and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So Jesus Christ says, look, I only came in my earthly ministry to Jews, to Israel. He even sent out some disciples during the time of his earthly ministry. And his earthly ministry, of course, would be here to the cross. And it was about three and a half years. And Jesus says in Matthew chapter 10, look at verse, I believe it's 5 and 6. Jesus tells his disciples, don't you dare go to any Gentiles in your ministry <laughs> before Jesus died. Look at what it says, Matthew chapter 10 and verse 5. Matthew 10, 5. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, what was the ministry of Jesus? Well, Jesus' ministry was the kingdom ministry. He brought with him the kingdom message. And the kingdom message was, if you'll accept me, I can set up my millennial kingdom. We just have to get through that seven-year period. But if you'll accept me, I can be your king back here. So the kingdom message, the gospel of the kingdom, was the ministry of Jesus Christ. Look at that in Matthew chapter 4. Well, actually, read the next verse, which I didn't read. <laughs> verse 7, Matthew 10, 7. As ye go, 
preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely ye have received, freely give. Now back to Matthew chapter 4, verse 23. Jesus came, and it says, And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing, and all manner of sickness and disease. So the kingdom message had to do with healing, and it had to do with miracles or signs. Well, if you know your Bible, the Bible says signs are for the Jews. So this ministry of Jesus was for Jews. And he came to these Jews, and he gave them a, a chance to accept them as Messiah or not. And he came with this message. Now, that is not the same message as today. Because something took place. Now, if you go to the book of Acts, did you know the book of Acts is a transition book? The book of Acts starts out one way and ends up entirely different. The book of Acts, we have Peter and the early apostles preaching, and they're telling them, get baptized in water for remission of sins. Do you know that's not the message all the way through Acts? That was just at the beginning. There's a change in the book of Acts from Jews to Gentiles, from Peter and the early apostles to Paul, from Jesus' ministry and, and signs and healings for Jews to the ministry of Paul, and now no more need for signs. They're supposed to believe by faith and not by sight. So when you understand that, you understand, oh, the book of, of Acts is a transitional book, you get the hint, and you go, oh, I get it. Come over with me to Romans chapter 11, and look at what it says. Romans chapter 11, and verse 13, Paul tells us very clearly. Romans eleven thirteen, For I speak to you Gentiles, and as much as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. So the apostle Paul says, my ministry is to more go to Gentiles. Now, I say more to Gentiles. Why? Because everywhere Paul went in the beginning, he went to the Jew first, tried to win them to the Lord. Then he went to the Gentiles. But as you get toward the end of the book of Acts, there's a place in Acts where he says, from henceforth I will go only to the Gentiles. And so toward the end of his ministry, he said, okay, I'm, I'm just going to go to Gentiles as a missionary. Now, I believe he got on the same page with the early apostles and taught them what God taught him. And I'll explain that here in a minute as well. But there's an important reason for the Apostle Paul being in the Bible. And if all you do as a Christian is go to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you don't go to Paul's epistles, then you're going to have some problems. Because Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John... Did you know those books are all Old Testament until Jesus actually dies? And it's at the end of those books where you start the New Testament. So much of the stuff written in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is still Old Testament under Jesus' ministry, his kingdom message to the Jews. Yet many in so-called Christianity today, what do they do? They only go to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They don't come over here to Romans, to Philemon, and even Hebrews. So what you need to do is you need to go to Paul because the heart of New Testament doctrine is Romans to Philemon. And, and I'll just put here Hebrews as well because I believe Paul wrote Hebrews and Hebrews tells us a lot of good things. But I think Hebrews was written first back here to those Jews. But then he went more to Gentiles. So when you look at these books, you find out that the heart of New Testament doctrine is the epistles of Paul. And you can't leave that out because God used Paul in a special way. And you know what God told Paul? The Bible teaches that God gave Paul many special revelations. And that's why we're supposed to follow Paul because Jesus gave Paul extra information. Now this is so important, but let me tell you what Paul says himself. Let's go to Romans chapter 15. Paul makes it very clear how his ministry was different than Jesus' ministry. And in Romans chapter 15, he tells us in verse 8, Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision, that's the circumcised people, the Jews, for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the Father. So Jesus' ministry was to Jews. Now look over at verse 16. Romans 15, 16, that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. So Paul says Jesus' ministry was for Jews to accept them as Messiah, but they didn't. 
So God chose me to now go and take the gospel message to the Gentiles. Do you know there are so many people who claim to be Christians that don't even understand that? Old Johann Arndt didn't understand that. He kept going back to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and trying to take things that were written to Jews and apply it to us. Now, there's some things Jesus said that we can spiritually apply to us, but there's some other things that Jesus said we don't apply to us. For example, Jesus said, if your right hand offends thee, cut it off. But we're in an age of grace. That doesn't sound like grace, does it? What, what, what possibly could that have to do? Well, that's for a Jew, probably in the tribulation. And there's a time when they do something in the right hand, perhaps. But some of the things that Jesus says in his earthly ministry are not for us today. For example, Peter says, Jesus, how many times should I forgive somebody? He said, 490 times. And I know people today say, I'm only going to give you 490 chances. And when you, and you do me wrong 490 times, we're done. <laughs> somebody asked Paul, how do we forgive others? Paul says, as Christ forgave us. Do you know the Bible says he forgave us of all trespasses? So we don't have to forgive only 490 times. We should always forgive others because Christ has forgiven us. So we see a big difference here. Now, does that mean that Jesus' ministry is over? No. Jesus' ministry for the Jews will start up here again in the tribulation. And all the stuff that Jesus and the early apostles were preaching in the early book of Acts, that goes back into effect over here. But if you want to read more about that, you can just go and read Romans chapter 11, written by Paul, in which he says God's not done with the Jews. But to provoke them to jealousy, he's dealing with the Gentiles more now. So it's very important that we see that. Now, the very important thing about Paul is that Jesus Christ revealed to Paul some mysteries and some revelations. I've heard people say, well, this Robert Breaker fellow doesn't know what he's talking about. No, I follow Jesus, and he follows Paul, and I just follow Jesus. And to say they're different, no, no, they're not different. I, I just follow Jesus. And I think to myself, that's someone that doesn't know what they're talking about. Because the only way to follow Jesus correctly is to follow Paul, because Jesus gave to Paul extra information for us. So if you're just following Jesus and not Paul, you're following the old message for Jews that hasn't been the updated message. You ever have a computer and sometimes it needs an update? Sometimes things don't work on your computer until you have the update. Well, that's what the Bible is. As you read through the whole Bible, you see in the book of Acts, oh, there's an update. Okay, Jesus is saying, okay, this information for the Jews, the kingdom message, it's on hold now because they rejected me as Messiah. Now let's update. Here's some more information. Here's the updates. Did you know there are seven mysteries in the Bible that were given to Paul? Seven mysteries given to Paul in the Bible. Isn't that something? And you know there were a bunch of revelations. God revealed to Paul certain things. And you've got to understand what those are. Let's go to Ephesians. So without Paul... You're missing everything that Jesus wants you to have. And that's sad. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1 through 6. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1 says, For this calls I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word, dispensation of grace, what we're in today, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. So God revealed it to Paul. Paul then goes and reveals it to the other apostles. He says, hey, look at what Jesus told me. So Jesus is telling him something. He's telling them something. Then they're going out and telling everybody, both Jew and Gentile. But without Paul, there's a lot of revelations we don't have. And those are revelations from Jesus. So you're not really following Jesus unless you're following Paul. Because Paul is the one that Jesus gave extra information to. And I can't tell you how many people I've met that claim to be Christians. And they say, but we don't follow Paul. We don't believe in Paul. We don't do anything with Paul. Matter of fact, my preacher never preaches from Paul. <laughs> I say, wow, that does not appear to be a true Christian. Because they don't understand how to rightly divide. But look at that. We'll continue reading there in Ephesians chapter 3, 
Look at verse 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ by the gospel. So again, there were seven mysteries given to Paul. If you want to have a good Bible study, go to my Bible study about the seven mysteries in the Bible. And then I have one about the seven mysteries to Paul. Because there's another mystery, and one of the mysteries was given to John, the apostle. Um, but we see this, and we see the mystery of the gospel. That's one of the mysteries. And it appears that one of the revelations given to Paul was the revelation of the gospel. The gospel means good news. And there's something that Paul was given, that Paul preached about salvation that was a little different than what was originally told by Jesus and told by Peter. If you go to Acts, in the beginning of Acts, chapter 2 and verse 38, Peter's telling everybody, water baptism saves. As you go on and you see the transition from Peter to Paul, Paul never tells anyone you get saved by water baptism. He says, believe that it's by faith that we're saved. Why is there a difference there? Is that a contradiction in the Bible? No, it's a transition in the Bible. It's a change. And there's a lot of that going on in the Bible, and you've got to understand that. So let's look at this. Go to Galatians chapter 1, and look at this revelation. If you don't get this, then you aren't even a Christian. Because I'm about to give you the gospel of salvation. And guess who the gospel of salvation for us today was given to by Jesus? It was given to Paul. So if you want to be a true follower of Jesus, you have to come through this revelation given to Paul to be saved. And that is the revelation of the gospel of salvation. Paul says in Galatians chapter 1, verse 11, But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. So Paul the Apostle says, Jesus Christ gave me the gospel. He says in chapter 2, verse 2, And then he went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which he preached among the Gentiles. So he goes and he's preaching the gospel. Now let's uh, flip over to Romans chapter 1. I want to show you this. Romans chapter 1, and look what it says. Paul says this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Paul says, I'm not ashamed. You're supposed to study the word of God so that you be not ashamed. I would hate to pretend to be a Christian my whole life and go to one of these churches that thinks we're still in the Old Testament or go to one of these churches that's trying to just go to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John but not going to Paul and the revelations to him. I would hate to be one of those people and die and then stand before God and God says, well, didn't you read the Bible? Didn't you get the message I gave Paul? Didn't you trust his gospel? And then say, uh, uh, I didn't even know about it. Well, then you're going to be ashamed. And guess where your eternal destiny will be? You see, if you're not trusting in the gospel of Paul, you're not saved. Look at Romans chapter 2 and verse 16. Look what Paul says. Paul says that the world will be judged according to this gospel, whether they believed it or not. Romans 2, 16. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. There's three times that Paul calls it my gospel. Why would Paul call it my gospel? Why? Why would he say my gospel? Because this is what was revealed to him by Jesus Christ. You want to be a follower of Jesus, do you? Do you want to be a follower of Jesus Christ? Then you must come through the revelation of Jesus Christ given to Paul, which is the gospel. And you've got to accept that gospel to be saved. That gospel is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 1 through 4. Let me show you the gospel that saves. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, and which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. Okay, so this is how we're saved. We're saved only through Paul's gospel. We're not saved by works. Some people say, if I do good works, then God will give me to heaven. That's not the revelation. That's not what Jesus said. That's not the gospel. The gospel is we're saved by faith, by believing. Faith is believing. So it's by faith. Faith in what? Well, notice what the gospel is. Verse 3, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died. How did he die? He shed his blood. So that's important. How that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. So I see 
five points with the gospel. And the five points of the gospel are Christ died for our sins, was buried, he rose again, and it was all according to the scriptures. Now, this is the gospel of Paul, and it has five points. Now, a lot of people look at this and they say, well, I don't see any difference there than what Peter preached. Peter said, you know, Jesus died and was buried and rose again. He even said, you know, according to the scripture, he even quoted some Old Testament Psalms and stuff. But the thing that they didn't preach was this right here, for our sins. This is what was revealed to Paul, and Paul's message was, the revelation to him, was justified, or justification by faith. Not of works. So the message that Paul preaches is that Jesus died for our sins. Let's go over there and look at Acts chapter 13. You ought to read the book of Acts sometime and see how things change through that whole book. It's a book of change. It's a book of transition. And God gives Paul this message, and he begins to preach this message. And here is, in a nutshell, Paul's message. Acts 13, 38, and 39. Let me write that up here. Acts 13. I'm running out of room today. Acts 13, 38, and 39. If you don't remember anything else in this message, remember this passage. This is probably the most ignored passage in, in the so-called Christian world. You'll never hear them reading this in the Catholic Church because they don't believe it. In many churches, they leave Paul out, and they leave out this message. But look at what the message of Paul is. It's justification, justified by faith. Acts 13, 38. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. So forgiveness through Christ, not through the law, not through your works. And by him, all that believe, you mean we're only saved by believing? You mean it's just by faith and we're saved? Yeah, that, that's it. But all that believe are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. So Paul preached you're justified by faith. You're saved by faith. Now, faith in what? Well, that's Romans chapter 3. Actually, let's go to Romans 5.1 again and see it again. Romans 5.1. It says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, go to Romans chapter 3 and verse 25. What should our faith be in, according to Paul? Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation. That means the act of appeasing wrath. It means basically a substitute. He died in our place, taking God's wrath upon him so that we don't have to pay for our sins in hell, and feel the wrath of God for our sins. So he died in my place for my sins. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. So, faith in the blood. So salvation today is through faith. That's what Paul says. And he says it's faith in the what? Blood atonement of Jesus. You've got to trust in what Jesus did to get you to heaven. See, under the law, they trusted in what they did. And they went around and bragged. Look at me. I keep the law. Look how great I am. Well, I deserve heaven because I do this, this, and this. And so the law was all about, look at me. I do dot, dot, dot. But Paul's message was, no, no, it's not what you do. You're a sinner. It's no good because it's done by a sinner. No, the message that the world needs, it's all what Jesus did. And you need to trust in what he did to be saved. So that's the difference. And that's the true gospel of salvation today. Yes, the early apostles might have mentioned death, burial, resurrection, but they didn't tell you now trust in the blood. Paul had to come to them. And in Acts chapter 15, you see Paul coming to the other apostles and giving them this message, and they get on board with it, and they understand. And in fact, Peter says how important the blood is and how you're redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so it's important that you understand that. A true Christian needs to understand that the gospel for us today is that gospel that was revealed to Paul. And it's the message of trust in the finished work of Jesus. Trust the gospel. The gospel is these five points. But the blood is the gospel. And the gospel is the blood. Because Jesus died for our sins. How? He shed 
his blood. And then when you look at the gospel, what's the rest? He was buried, but he rose again. Why did Jesus rise again? He rose again to go up to heaven, and the Bible talks about the mercy seat in heaven. And the Bible says he went into the holy place made without hands. That's the holy of holies in heaven. And he put his blood on the mercy seat before God in heaven. I believe with all my heart that Jesus' blood is in heaven. Even if some so-called Christians out there say otherwise. <laughs> yeah, you know who I'm talking about. The people that say, it's not the blood that saves you, it's just the death. No, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. If you know your Old Testament, you know what did they have. They had a priest. And the man that was guilty cut the throat of the animal, and the blood was caught. And then he walked away, but then the blood was offered on the altar. So Jesus, he shed his blood on the cross, but then he offered it up on the altar as the high priest for all of us. And it was not the altar here on earth, it was the one in heaven. So we find that uh, the message of true Christianity is the message of number one, we're in the New Testament, not in the Old Number two, the message of true Christianity is there's a difference between the ministry of Paul and the ministry of Jesus. And we're over here in this ministry, Paul's ministry. Number three, true Christianity understands that Paul is so important because of the revelations and mysteries given to him. And one of those being the gospel of salvation. And you can't even be saved unless you accept that gospel message that Paul preached which, by the way, was given to him by Jesus Christ. So you're not even a true follower of Jesus unless you're following Paul. Another thing that a true Christian and true Christianity preaches is that once you're saved, you can't lose it. Because now you are eternally secure in the body of Christ. And that's one of the things that Paul taught. He taught eternal security. Paul taught that when you're saved, you are born again. And he taught you are sealed. So he taught being born again, and he taught you become a son of God. And he said that Jesus Christ seals you, and you are sealed. We call this eternal security. Now some people today, they claim to be Christians, but they have a false gospel. Some of them are telling you to get back under the law. And keep it, and they tell you, now, when you do good works, we'll keep your fingers crossed, you just might go to heaven. That is a false Christianity. That is not true Christianity. Other people, they say, well, no, no, we'll follow Jesus, but they're only following Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all before Jesus died, and so they're still in Jesus' earthly ministry, and they're not in the ministry of Paul, which is for us today, the Gentiles. They're still in a, a ministry for Jews. They're following the kingdom message, not the message of salvation. For us today. How sad. And many of them, their um, gospel is, he that endureth to the end shall be saved. And so they think, if I just keep doing good works until I die, then God will accept me. But we saw what Paul said, not of works, lest any man should boast. But then we have some other people that say, well, okay, yeah, all right, I'll follow Paul. I'll listen to some of the things Paul says. I'll, I'll accept the teachings of Paul. But I don't believe that once we're saved, we're always saved. I think we can lose it. Well, then you're not following Paul, and you're not following Jesus. Because the revelation that Jesus gave to Paul, one of them was the mystery of the body of Christ. And that when you're saved, you're a part of his body and a part of his flesh. And he's not going to cut himself. He's not going to cast off himself. You are in him, and he is in you. The Bible teaches in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 9, Hebrews, that's Paul, that Jesus Christ is the author of eternal salvation. So when Jesus died on the cross and shed his blood, he became the author of what the Bible calls eternal salvation. What is eternal salvation? Eternal means forever. So once saved, always saved means I got saved, salvation, <laughs> but when I got saved, I'm saved for all eternity. That's what salvation is. But you have some people, and many of them are your Pentecostals or your Charismatics, who say, no, I don't believe in once saved, always saved. I think if you come to Jesus, well, he'll, he'll save you, but then you lose it if you sin. <laughs> or you got to keep it by not sinning. Um, then you're not sealed. 
Sealed means you take something and you put it in something and it can't come out. It's sealed. And all these passages are in the Bible of Paul telling us that when we're saved, there's a spiritual birth that takes place. We're born again. We're born into the family of God. We are sons of God. And we are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And that's what the Bible teaches. Let's look at a couple. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 15. 1 Corinthians 4.15 says, For though ye have ten thousand instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus... I have begotten you through the gospel. He says, I have begotten you. Begotten means born, born again. You're born again. He tells us that again in Galatians chapter 4, verse 29 through 31. He talks about those who are born of the Spirit. There's a spiritual birth that takes place when you're trusting in the blood of Christ. And when you accept the gospel and you believe in the blood, atonement, you believe the gospel, you become a new creature. Paul says, all things are become new. Behold, you're a new creature. So you're born again. And then in Ephesians, let's turn over to Ephesians chapter 1. The Bible teaches, Paul teaches, because this was a revelation given to him, that the Holy Spirit of God comes inside of you. And the Holy Spirit of God dwells in you who are saved. And the Bible tells us exactly how long it dwells in you. And nowhere in the Bible, in Paul's writings, does it say, and the Holy Spirit comes in you and then leaves. <laughs> That's the opposite of what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches the Holy Spirit comes inside a believer and stays there and dwells there. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13. The Bible says this, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Now look at this, verse 14, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. 4.30, go to Ephesians 4.30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed until the day of redemption. What is the day of redemption? The redemption of your body when the rapture comes and you get a glorified body. So when I'm saved, I'm washed in the blood of Jesus, my soul, and my sins are gone. And I am forgiven. Now, that doesn't mean I can't sin. I can sin. Should I sin? No. But when I sin, do I lose my salvation? No, because I can't lose something that's forever. Eternity or eternal means forever and unchanging. So when I become a son of God, I am always a son of God. My father is my father. If I move to the other side of the world and I change my name, he's still my father. I can't lose my sonship. Okay? My dad has passed away. He's still my father. So when I'm born again, my father now is God, the father. And I can't lose that. I'm always going to be a son of God, but I can sure do wrong and be chastised here on earth for it. And I can still lose rewards in heaven by doing wrong. That makes me think, wow, I don't want to do wrong. I want to do right because I am a son of God and I am sealed. And it says there, until the day of redemption. So don't tell me that a person can lose their salvation. But there are people out there that say, well, yeah, they can. I don't believe that. That's not what Paul teaches. But some of these so-called Christians, who I would call false Christians that don't belong to true Christianity, they teach you can lose your salvation. But how is that even possible? Have you ever read Ephesians chapter 5? Go to Ephesians chapter 5 sometime and see how Paul talks about it being like marriage and how he's the type of the husband and she's the type of the wife, the church. And uh, what did Paul say that Jesus said in Hebrews 13, 5? Paul says that Jesus says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Jesus Christ says to us, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. We see in all the passages of Paul that there's no way that you can lose salvation. It's a once saved, always saved thing. And true Christianity understands the message of Paul, the message of eternal security. Do you? So Paul is important. You can't follow Jesus without following Paul. You can't have your doctrine straight without following the revelations of Jesus to Paul. Three times Paul tells us to follow him. Let's go to 1 Corinthians. And yet I have met over the last probably 10, 15 years so many people who claim to be Christians who belong to denominations in which they claim to be mainstream Christian denominations who say things like, Paul shouldn't be in the Bible. And Paul's not the right one to follow. And Paul, he, he's a false apostle and he put himself in the Bible, but he's not really of God. And things like that. 
And I think to myself, you are not a true Christian. Because a true Christian would never say that. A true Christian understands that God chose Paul. How many times in his epistles does he say, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, chosen by God. <laughs> chosen by Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16. Paul says, Wherefore I beseech you, be ye followers of me. Now let's flip over Philippians chapter 3. Do you want to be a true Christian? Do you want to be someone that has the true doctrine? Do you want true Christianity, or do you want it to belong to some false religious denomination that teaches otherwise? They all have something in common. They all seem to leave Paul out. Isn't that interesting? Philippians chapter 3 and verse 17. Philippians 3, 17. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. Two times Paul says, follow me. Now the third time, look what Paul says. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Or no, 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. 1 Corinthians 11, 1. Paul says, be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Anybody who says Paul is not of God and shouldn't be in the Bible, they must not have read the Bible. Because Paul says, I follow Christ, so follow me. Because many of the mysteries and revelations that we know today in the Bible were those given to Paul. And if you leave Paul out, you're back under this time when it was only to the Jews, and it's a different message. And you're not coming to the true gospel of salvation, which is really for more to the Gentiles. Now, Jews can get saved today through the same gospel, but it's more for Gentiles. Let's close with Acts chapter 26. Let me ask you this. Do you go to church? In your church, does the preacher preach correctly? Does he have true Christianity, or is he preaching some sort of a milksop message? I've been to churches before, and it was very easy to see if that church was a true Bible-believing church or not by where they spent their time. A lot of churches spend their time just in the Old Testament. <laughs> a lot of churches spend their time just in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I like to be here preaching from Paul. Because that's the heart of New Testament doctrine. Yeah, you could preach from other parts of the Bible, but bring it back to Paul. Because that's what's most for us today. Acts chapter 26, verse 15 to 18. The Apostle Paul is giving his testimony of when he saw God on, on the road to Damascus. And he says in verse 15, And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee, to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. So Paul is telling us the reason that God chose him was to go to the Gentiles, preach to them how to receive the forgiveness of sins. And it's by faith which is in him. True Christianity preaches faith alone in the finished work of Christ. Not what you do to get yourself to heaven, but trusting in what Jesus did to take you there. So, if you go to church, do you belong to a church that's part of true Christianity? Are they trying to get you back under the law? Is your church a true Bible-believing church, preaching the doctrine for today? Or are they getting you back underneath the before New Testament message, and they're getting you under the kingdom message? Is that where you are? Are you in a true Bible-believing church? Or are they trying to mix grace and the law, works and faith, and trying to put the two together? You can't. Oil and water don't mix. The law and grace don't mix. Faith and works don't mix. It's faith alone in the finished work of Christ, His blood, the gospel. Do you belong to a church that believes, oh yeah, we think it's faith, but well, oh, you can lose it if you don't do works. That's someone mixing faith and works. That's not the true message. You need to get right with God if you're going to a, a church that doesn't preach true Christianity. And you need to find out and look in your heart and see, am I trusting in the blood atonement of Christ? Am I trusting this alone for salvation, or am I trusting in my denomination? Jesus saves, but he only saves through faith. And I want you to be saved. I want you on your way to heaven. I want you to know you're saved. 
And that's why I've come to you today to try to explain to you that it's all by faith in the blood of Christ. It's all trusting in what Jesus did. And I wanted to try to show you the importance of Paul. And I brought that to you because of this book right here. Johann Arndt was a good Protestant, but he was very, very Calvinistic. Wrote his book in about 1500s. This is it in English, translated in Oh, translated in 1712 and printed in 1809. And this book, in the very beginning, he's all about Paul and justified by faith, and Paul and justified by faith, and Paul and justified by faith. And at the end of the book, he's all, you got to endure to the end or you might lose it. <laughs> what did he do wrong? He mixed the two instead of sticking to the one that's for us today. Yes, it's good to do good works. God wants us to do good works. I want to do good works so that when I get to heaven, I get more rewards. But I'm not doing good works to stay saved or to get saved. It's because I am saved, I serve the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is true Christianity. Not of works for salvation. After salvation, I work for Jesus because I'm saved. And because I appreciate him and all he's done for me. All right, God bless you. We'll see you next week. The Lord willing. Hope you get this message, and I hope you get into a good Bible-believing church that preaches true Christianity. Don't forget Paul. Amen.